the past 10 years, I've worked and collaborated, collaborated and researched together with both private and public sector in terms of how they can use and collaborate, consume open source. And one common question I commonly cr come across on both the public and private side is, can we use this? Is it safe enough? Can we trust that it's maintained? Is it sustainable? Um, so for the past almost one year and well, one year ahead, we have this research project where we're working together with primarily the Swedish industry and uh, Scania, um, working to develop a health assessment framework enabling um, you and your organizations to evaluate the, the open source components that you use, but also that you're potentially considering in your intake process as, as a way to be more secure and, and address the, the risks that taking in open source that has a low level of health or sustainability. Um, so this, this can enable you both in a sourcing option, should you choose something else, or uh, should you develop it or whatever? Um, or is this something that you're dependent on Then maybe you actually need to go in there and try to engage and contribute back uh, to the project that you are using and are depending on? So this is a way trying to, to identify these and analyze them uh, on a more qualitative level. Is this, is this um, a project uh, where you should engage in or how should you consider it in your intake process? So what I'm presenting today is like a first draft of this framework um, where we've identified 107 characteristics over 15 different themes. So open source health is a very multi-faceted multi topic. It's, it has so many streams, so many perspectives, so many nuances. So it's very difficult to get a complete picture. So this was our first step uh, in, in doing this. Uh, so I'm going to give you some context here, trying to describe what, what, what I consider open source health. Um, and you're all welcome to, to engage. And going to give you an overview of the different perspective that, that we found, um, the different nuances of health. And also going to, to give you an example way of applying it in practice, um, as I did when I supported a large international organization in Sweden uh, in terms of uh, this, but applying uh, a pre an already existing set of metrics, the, the chaos framework, which I will come back to. Okay, so first off, what is open source health? There are many, many uh, definitions here. I consider it in, in lines with sustainability definitions. It's a product's capability to stay viable and maintained over time without interruption or weakening, so that there is a high quality maintenance all through. You can also look at it from, from um, a more ecosystem perspective, consider it pro pro its productivity, robustness and openness. Productivity meaning how active is it, how actively is it developed in terms of robustness or stability rather, how concentrated is the development to one or a few individuals or one or a few companies and then openness, how open uh, is it for, for you and your organization or you as individuals to actually come in there and contribute and influence the direction on where it's heading. And I don't think this is anything new to people here in the room, but open source is everywhere. It's part of our digital infrastructure and just as physical infrastructure, roads and bridges, it needs maintenance to, to stay viable and secure. So hence the um, analogy to, to um, bumps and cracks. So we, we need to care for its maintenance. And I think this strip here from XKDC is quite well shared on, on Twitter, where all of the modern digital infrastructure really relies on these small open source components, often maintained by one or a few individuals, uh, quite often in the, in the spare time still, even though some, people, some of these maintainers are, are, have started to more develop different business models or being employed and so on. Um, this one refers to the, the current project maintained by Daniel Stenberg in Sweden. But a lot of people I, I talk to still in both public and private sector, at least in Sweden, they think that, that this is not an issue, that it's, it's cared for by others. Well, the fact is that 
yeah, sure, given enough eyeballs, all things are shallow, or all bugs are shallow, but it really requires that enough eyeballs actually reaches the source code, that enough people actually engage and help with the maintenance, at least to the level that it's sustained. So we have a free riding. I don't know if I want to call it an issue, because it's also good. I mean, open source is there to use. The more people who use it, the more popular it gets, and eventually the more eyes on it there will be. So I wouldn't say that free riding is an issue, but it, it can have good and bad aspects. So here, here comes the, the thing, okay, but what, where does the free rider issue apply? So here we can talk about the tragedy of the commons connecting to the free rider issue, where that exemplified in this by, by Hardin in 68, by this open pasture, where the rational farmer keeps on adding animals and animals, maximizing their own benefit, which eventually will lead to overgrazing and lost opportunities or, or lost potential for other farmers to, to benefit from, from, the, from the pasture. So this may be considered an, um, what Eleanor Ostrom, a famous political economist, calls a, a common pool resource basically a resource system. So imagine the, the open pasture the, with, with, the, with the grass being the resource system and it having resource units being the grass. This is, it's non-exclusive in it's that it's difficult to exclude others from, um, or costly at least, and it's subtractable. The more you utilize from it, and if, if it's not maintained or allowed to replenish itself, it will eventually be depleted and destroyed. And I've seen a lot of anal analogies of common pool resources to open source software. Well, I, I'd, I'd like to make the, the, the third here that it's actually the brain time and the maintenance labor or effort here that is the common pool resource. This is the resource system. The, the resource units is the time that maintainers have available or that is put in by the community into the maintenance of this. Um, and yeah, maintainers are humans, not robots. They can easily shift an interest, but they can also burn out. We've seen a lot of research or just change family conditions or working conditions or the employer um, refactorizes their code base, adopts a new product strategy or innovates their business model. And all of a sudden the maintenance is gone. So what happened? What are you gonna do now? So how can you and your organizations uh, and in your use case, in your intake process, how can we, how can we find these cracks and bumps before they appear? How, how can we identify these open source projects and, and, and put in the effort to, to help with the maintenance and raise the health? Um, and also enable you to make an, a more informed decision on what software you are using and help your engineering departments and organizations to make better choices and help you with a better risk management process here. So we say by considering the, the health of, of open source in your intake process. So allowing you in to, to consider on a, on a more rough level, at least in the intake process usually in, in an organization to, to consider this. Um, but I've also seen in uh, on the acquisition level, especially from public sector, where you have the procurement process, there is a need to be very thorough here to be able to compare open alternatives between each other, but also to, to the proprietary options. And this is all quite commonly, at least in the Swedish context, where public sector falls short in choosing open options because IT security or cyber security or someone come and says that it's not secure. We can't trust open source. Um, we have to go with what they're using in the municipality next door. So what we did again, we found 146 studies and 107 characteristics. So 106 or seven things that could characterize health on an open source project. That, that's quite a lot. And I don't think that we can consider everything when we're thinking of taking an uh, NPM library into our, um, into our development. Um, these are divided among 15 themes, so a bit higher. Um, but still, we need some kind of prioritization here, what to look for and so on. And this is very contextual to your organizations. 
So in the, in the application I did with the chaos metrics, which I will explain in, the, in a moment, we interviewed and worked with the company trying to find out what their risks are and really boiling it down. So I'm not saying that we have to consider all 107 characteristics, but considering health of an open source product is basically painting a, a, a picture and then being able to interpret that from your perspective and what, what you consider a risk and so on, or what risks you are willing to take and so on. And um, so the slides are available on uh, the schedule platform. So here is the supplemental material where we have all of the data uh, referenced with all of the 107 characteristics going down into the different papers, the literature. Um, and also we listed the metrics uh, connecting to the different characteristics. I'm not explaining that here. I'm, I didn't bring that up in the paper, but it is there for you to dive into if you want. Uh, if there is any paper that you need access to, just contact, contact me and I, I, can, I can help you with that because not everything is open access. Um, so the framework structure here, so I talked about this assessment framework. So really trying to organize all of these aspects. One dimension is the level of abstraction. On the more upper level, considering the network or the software ec ecosystem that the, your, your, the, the focal open source product is a part of, for example, the NPM package ecosystem or the OpenStack ecosystem or your dependency structure on, on GitHub. And then characteristics relating more towards the more focal project. Then we'll have the more social technical dimension because you have characteristics relating to the more human and community side here, the, the, the more people side of the development, while you have the more technical and project related characteristics like the, the software development process and the quality of the, the source code developed, what kinds of documentation is, is there available. And then the more process and governance related aspects or characteristics in the orchestration uh, theme or part. So I'm not, don't be afraid, I'm not going to describe 107 characteristics, but just to, to, to give you a feel for it. So one of the themes is communication. So how productive is an open source project in planning and discussing the evolution, be it over different mediums. So here we saw response time, how quick is the maintainers and the community in asking or responding to, to questions, be it over a pull request or an issue or the, the chat or whatever. Um, the quality of these responses, the social activity, um, and also the visibility was also lifted on, on uh, Twitter and, uh, and other platforms. There was one study quite recently highlighting how Twitter actually can have a positive, or being active on Twitter can actually have a positive effect, although slightly, on growing your contributor base. Culture, which is a bit, a bit more softer, uh, and not that easily to... Um, to measure quantitatively, which requires more of a qualitative approach in, in uh, measuring or, or characterizing. So how able is the community to facilitate an open and inclusion, inclusive collaboration? So are there conflicts represented? Are, are there conflicts? Uh, how severe are they? How are they managed? Is all discussions blown out of proportion or is there uh, some kind of sanity in, in, the, in, the, in the discussions? Sentiment, toxicity is, is a quite large topic. There are a lot of different uh, algorithms now being developed trying to, to characterize the sentiment and toxicity from different perspectives in, in these discussions. Openness for, um, for, um, for input, uh, are you shut down? Re recognition of new contributions or people coming in. Diversity, another soft topic. Um, how able is the community to accommodate and attract a diverse community of actors? Um, but also from a technical perspective, because we can talk about the diversity of applications that are implementing or using the open source project, um, the demographic diversity of the people inside the community and those using it, and also the organizational diversity. What kind of organizations are using? Are there a lot of vendors or a lot of pure consumers of it? Um, and how, how stable are they if we talk about financial situation um, and how stable is the, the community, 
does the maintainer have a business model? Is uh, the maintainer employed uh, in some way to work on it, provide support services or anything? Popularity, a bit more easily to measure quantitatively uh, in some ways. Competing products was one aspect here. Uh, are there alternatives? How popular are they? Um, stability, a bit more larger theme. How capable is the product in terms of preserving a critical population? So a lot of things about retention. How, what's the turnover of contributors in the, in the product? How long do they stay? Uh, how, uh, how, what, what's the level of um, bribe by contributors? Um, and uh, also what, what level or stage in the life cycle process is the, is the product? Is it entering a dormancy or is it on its growth? I mean, and th these are characteristics that I, I would really lift up and con consider in how you interpret the different health aspects because a project in its growth phase, I think you would need to look quite differently at that compared to a project in its more stable phase or dormancy phase. Um, and also technical activity and for example distinguishing between the activity of the general community the actual maintainers and the overall community from a more technical perspective the development process is there a contribution process how well detailed is it is it easy to understand uh, is it well applied um, or is there still a lot of questions asked about how to make a contribution are there good sample, good newbie or um, start, starting off issues? Is there an onboarding process? How good is that? Uh, quality assurance and so on. Documentation, um, more qualitative perspectives. How complete is it? How complex is it? And uh, how up to date is it? Its currentness, but also what kinds of, of, of documentation is there? Is there a requirement doc? Is there a testing strategy? Uh, is there a roadmap? Is there a user documentation? Uh, what's the level of the more technical developer documentation? General characteristics are these different technical features that affects the, the popularity or, and health of the project, we, as we found in, in literature. And it can be the application domain, um, where in the stack it is. If it's middleware, maybe it's not that um, visible to people. They're not, they don't know they're using it, while in the front end, people are more aware. And what kind of technology is it? Is it JavaScript or is it C? They're, they can attract uh, different amounts of people depending on the community. Licensing aspects, um, more from the company consumer perspective. Scaffolding, talking more about the infra infrastructure, how accessible and open is it? How quickly can you set up the build environment, how e easy is it? Um, security, both in terms of general security practices uh, applied, how long is uh, how long does it take from a uh, vulnerability is, uh, or a CV is discovered until it's fixed and released? And then the more technical quality perspective, which is more non-functional non, uh, requirements. Uh, maintainability and um, but also looking more at the source code a lot of papers highlighting the importance of um, not too complicated or um, the quality actually of the source code and more governance and orchestration related so how mature and open the orchestration is in the in the project to enable an open and inclusive collaboration both on the actual project community level but also on the more larger level if it's part of a foundation or um, some uh, the GNU ecosystem or whatever. So there are some limitations here, of course. We did not do a systematic review, but we did find 146 papers and we did reach a saturation in the number of or the types of characteristics we found. So we could have continued, but we chose to stop because, yeah, it was, things were repeating them, them, themselves. Um, we saw limited coverage of characteristics on the network level, but that has to do with what the, our, our research strategy, where we started from. So we could have continued that aspect, but that would have blown the start out, out of proportions. And also, did we define health correctly? I mean, again, there are multiple definitions here. 
but we had a process that we tried to be consequent in how we applied the definitions and so on. So just to give you some highlights here of initiatives that are very quite mature that I'd like to highlight. Uh, for example, the Chaos Project most prominently, uh, which I think it started 2017 or 18 at the LF Member Summit. Uh, I was there, but not in that room, unfortunately. Um, so that's a community of developers, practitioners, researchers, community people that ha that develop metrics in working groups, for example, relating to risk, value, evolution, inclusivity, diversity, ecosystem, and so on. Um, how we differ is that we just considered research or the literature that, that we could identify. And just as with the Chaos Project, we have pr currently developed a smorgasbord of different metrics where you have to pick and choose the ones that are the most suitable for your context. Our aim in, in our coming cycles of research, we're going to collaborate a lot of with Scania and a select set of companies to, to make this more applicable to provide cases where in the automotive, automotive context and this, these type of projects, these are the metrics that they apply and so on. And we also have a close collaboration with um, software analytics company in Sweden uh, where we have a close collaboration trying to see how which parts of these characteristics can be automated and so on. So that's another important thing of the, of the project. Open Security Foundation, maybe some of you know, quite good. They have a lot of best practices, checklists, um, uh, best practices, badges, and so on. Sustain OSS are really inclusive, good community. I'd like to highlight into, if you're interested in these sustainability health aspects. There are quite good discussions there. Um, so how can you apply this in practice? So this was a lot of theory, but can you actually apply it in some sense? So to get some input into this, so I, I worked part-time as an open source strategist at another company, at, at one company. And what we did there, basically we could consider a pre-trial to this research project where we tried to, to develop a process, um, but based on the chaos metrics where we, so this process was owned by the enterprise architects, um, where our main objective was to lower the risk level here of the open source that was considered in, in the intake process. Goals having a decentralized self-managed process enable but don't overburden the developers need to be it needs to be simple and we need to be, enable follow-up and actionable insights so we can do a more thorough stra strategic work here on what products we're, we're focusing on and what we're using. So we developed a questionnaire based on the chaos metrics um, and our main, main, main concerns and risks as well as the types of uh, open source projects that, that were used. We, we find out through the group discussions, interviews, and this is the approach I would recommend you, uh, either you as representatives in your organization or your open source program officers, wh what champions you have, what kind of functions you have. Really go out and talk to your organization, get to know your organization, what types of products are you using, um, and where are you using it, who are using it, and so on. Um, we observed developers applying this questionnaire and we went down from two hours, which was really extreme, but that pe person was very thorough. But we managed to get it down to 10, 15 minutes, which is at some kind of max with what a developer have time to spend evaluating. I mean, they, they make quick decisions or we make quick decisions in this sense. We can't pay, uh, spend too much time here. Um, but still, we need to find some kind of level uh, where we can raise the awareness and be a bit more thorough than we are today. Um, and the, the outtake here was that it, it was considered to raise the awareness and decrease the overall risk in the intake process. So I would say a lot of the main thing here, the main goal here is, is to increase awareness and provide developers, engineers with a framework that they can use with their experience to more interpret and consider the open source product that they are using or take the help of of their peers which maybe have more interest or more experience in, in open source in using open source and so on because a lot of 
developers they have their experience they they have the things they look for some people ha look for other things um, new people may don't, maybe don't know what to look for so this is a way to help them zero down or find a common language in what they look for things to consider again interview and map up your concerns consider the types of project uh, used keep it lightweight uh, it's a checklist simple answers yes or no simple categories but still try to capture these different aspects um, must be easy to find a process the data to answer these questions so if, if really provide directions okay type this git command to get this number to be able to answer the question or only spend five minutes in the issue tracker to get a feel for how well how quick people respond um, really try to 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 frame it automate where possible again if you can script things build an application in, in and especially into your to, to your existing pipeline um, that that would be good because we today we use very large amounts of open source so there needs to be so really to do this in a more mature fashion I would really recommend some kind of flagging function where you take a set of the characteristics or the metrics that you identify and automate it so you can get red or, or, or yellow orange flags on projects and then with these projects then you can go in and have a look on a more qualitative level closer level where you can use the more checklist that you are otherwise using in the intake process um, and again there's no one model or number here to describe the level of health or sustainability of our open source project it's really so the 107 characteristics and the 15 themes and so on these are different pencils that allows you to create your picture of how you interpret open the, the health and then you need the guidance in, in coming up with a, a conclusion out of the painting just when you're walking around a museum trying to what the artist mean here um, different characteristics can help you guide, uh, guide guide you in creating this picture um, yeah and I won't go into this but we did a, a pre-trial as well at, at the Swedish employment service where I helped them in an acquisition process evaluating two different open source based e-archival solutions again highlighting the importance of considering open source health but sometimes you need to be a bit more rough on the edges and do it quickly to uh, to address the risks in a, in a, on a suitable level but in the procurement process from the public perspective you really need to be thorough and be able, able to motivate so even here the, the health perspective has uh, a potential use case to, to fill in the future we will iterate on this again with, with companies um, and trying to make it more precise and uh, and detailed in certain use cases for certain uh, open source projects and so on so, but again trying to create these reference points that you and your organizations can maybe tie closer to to get a more feel for what you should look for uh, we're also going to go more deep on the metrics level uh, for observations uh, seeing how more experienced engineers how they what they look for when we explain these characteristics and see how that compares to what scientists have found um, and also as i said we, we have a close collaboration with a uh, software analytics company so we're gonna see how we can automate as much as possible of, out of this cool yes yes one two three four five enabling comparison between open and closed alternatives in our acquisition yeah. yes because right, there's a lot of points about open source software and, and especially the evaluation you're talking about that you get to take a look at you get to measure mm. uh, that a lot of closed source companies don't let you look at no you can't see these details no so for all you know you're walking into a, a well i mean uh, i won't <coughs> i had to stop myself before i said something <laughs> walking into a situation that's, that's far worse than you might imagine yeah uh, I, I mean um, we've had a, you know examples of that in the past that just kind of blew up and everybody had to you know find 
somewhere to go somewhere else. Mm-hmm. So this does, doesn't allow you to have a direct com- a comparison. It just gives you a, a feeling for the open source side of stuff, right? Yeah, but again, it, it builds up what level of trust can you put in the community? Mm-hmm. What capabilities do you have y- yourself to use it? Or are there uh, vendors more commonly in the, in the public context that, can, that you can contract that can really provide the same uh, service level agreement and the same quality standards uh, that you buy from uh, a proprietary vendor. But in so the, the plus with the open alternatives is that you actually can go in and, and see the quality, how they comment on, on things, what their the, the, the dependency tree, um, how active the development is and, and so on. Um, wow which you can't in, in the more closer. I mean, you, you can demand that your, your agency's developers should be able to review the code, but it's not all everyone that, that are quite, that fund found with, uh, with doing that. Um, so it's really, yeah, you enabling comparison, basically enabling a comparison. Okay, but how can you trust the, the open source? Because the open alternatives, as I said, they are quite, quite often dismissed just on the pre-notion that they are unsafe. So it sounds to me like what this is really for is, as you said, a lot of the open source alternatives might be just dismissed out of hand, right? So this is about building the faith in them, but the the faith in the closed source alternatives has always just kind of been assumed. So this is this is kind of a way to prove one side, and then the other side is kind of just where it is. Yeah, but on, on the closed side, you have a contractual arrangement where you you can sue or put someone at stand if someone something goes wrong. Yeah. On the open alternatives, there is no one by default that you can blame or put on the stand. Then you have to pay someone. Right. Uh, so this is an important part of this evaluation process. Okay. All right, thanks. thanks. Any other questions? A general question. D- 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 uh, yeah, sure. Um, I think a lot of it can be automated, uh, but there are a lot of soft issues mm-hmm. or topics, like I, like I mentioned in, in, the, in the beginning, like diversity, culture. Um, I mean, you, you can define your dependent variables here, of course, or independent variables. Um, but again, it's how, mu- then it's how much you trust the, these points here. Uh, and there are research into all of these different streams for example again toxicity and sentiment which is a very growing topic in research there are developments in different models uh, for determining or identifying tos- toxicity and different kinds of toxicities uh, but it's a matter of how much you can trust these models um, i don't think that they are this mature at the moment well from what i've seen i could be wrong um, but again some things you need to look more qualitatively. Um, so on, when, when doing this more of a thorough investigation, l- it leaves room for this uh, type of analysis. But in your intake process, uh, I don't think that an employee would allow their front-end developers to go in and determine the level of culture uh, in, in the community of each package uh, even though it may be just one individual but but still um, but I, I think a lot of it can be automated but a lot of things are are um, quite qualitative so that that's why I really highlight this aspect of trying to integrate it into your pipeline in, introduce some kind of flagging function where you should go in and look so kind of some kind of pre-screening process does anyone here uh, con- consider the Health or sustainability in, in your intake process? Do you need a security scorecard by the open SSF? Yeah. That at least gives you some measure of yeah. like diversity and business measures and yeah. the security of the project. Yeah. I think it's a great tool. Yeah. How do you apply that in your? Uh, well, you can look at your, your dependencies. Um, yeah. Like I work with a lot of open source projects and you can, uh, you can look at your dependencies and see what, what scores they have, for example. Yeah. 
Do you use that consequently for your full intake process? Um, yeah. Or, or, or to, yeah. yeah. And what's the uh, out outcome if it's a bad score? <laughs> <laughs> Are you satisfied with, with it, or do you see any room for improvement? Uh, there's always room for improvement, actually. Um, yeah, I mean, in terms of improving automation, and the adoption, you know, that's something that's important. Hmm. You, I'm not putting you on the stand, but you in the purple, <laughs> looking down at your computer. <laughs> <laughs> Did you consider health in your organization as well? How do you uh, do that? Well, we, we refer to all the but yeah. to the uh, other organizations. Yeah. So what do you consider? Uh, so uh, parameters for activity, diversity of the community, mm -hmm. um, kind of the value in, in how much is invested by the community in yeah. the product, in the investor, and security of that. Yeah. How do they handle the problems that they encounter? Yeah. Have you automated this, or is this a qualitative check? How long does it take for it to, to go through the list? Uh, too long. Too long, okay. <laughs> <laughs> More than a time or two. <laughs> 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 More than 15 minutes, so yeah. we already uh, we had noted a, down. Uh, we noted down. Yeah. Okay. But again, it's a, it's a matter of how far do you want to be? How, when can you reach a level where you think that the risk is acceptable, that you're increasing the awareness for the engineers to to make this decision on how far you you are in your how much you trust your engineers also. I think they only want to believe that they can help you. Hmm. That it's a fictional problem. Yeah. And they want to focus on that. Yeah. Any other inputs, reflections? Um, yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's it's um, I, I condensed it based on the the chaos metrics. So I mean, the original data. But I can um, I can share that. Yes, I can update the um, the PowerPoint in the, on the sketch uh, sked um, platform as an append appendix. Yeah. You said you're working with companies, including to actually develop automation. Yeah, we're collaborating with one company that are developing a tool support for this. They're, they're previously, they were called Debrict. Now they're uh, acquired by MicroFocus, I think. And are they exploring studies on open source? Uh, they are, uh, in, in the research project, the, the goal is that they are going to release their data model uh, open. Outside of industry, in say NGOs, governmental practices, or other areas, or what do you plan on doing? So again, um, the project is focused on private, yep. but I, I, I have a, uh, I like working with the public because of the impact and societal aspects, and the only only aspect that or thing I know of is when I applied it in the in the context of the. Um, of the uh, Swedish employment uh, agency, yep. um, but that actually led to those e-archival professionals. They were starting to talk about open source health at national and international conferences with people working with e-archival solutions. So, I mean, for every case that we apply this, it, it spreads and, and people get to know it because open source health is sustainability. Though these are new words to people. I mean, people in Swedish public sector, they hardly know what open source is. Um, so, and a main, a main, a main uh, challenge here is that they think it's insecure or that's what people are telling. So this is a way to counter argue this. So it becomes a tool for them to, uh, to work with. 
but hopefully yes we can come to there cool thanks <laughs>